por eso es igual. Ah. Entonces hay que dejar a de su lado. Okay. The other idea that you have over here is very simple. It goes back to this. So where you are in Lenya. Okay. Look up here already come. Look up here on less than 4,000. There is no high WBC count. Look up here, Uremia, and high potential. Requiring vasopressors. High potential requiring vasopressors. So it makes it very simple. So when somebody asks you which patient needs to go into the ICU, you should be able to tell this. Any patient who is requiring mechanical ventilation, any patient who is in septic shock, who is requiring vasopressors despite fluid resuscitation, any patient who is hypotensive after fluid resuscitation, any patient who has got multi lobar infiltrates with PF ratios less than 250 with uremia with the presence of temperature less than 36 with an RR of more than 30, you should be able to say this feedback. Because that's what we are expecting. Okay, these is the criteria that you require to admit your if we are committing acquired pneumonia patients into the ICU. Right? Clear? Clear of this as of now? Uh, any any doubts on this till now? Any doubts? Okay. So now now that we know about community acquired pneumonia, the other entity that we talk about is hospital acquired pneumonia. Now what is hospital acquired pneumonia? Can you tell me about the hospital acquired pneumonia? What would be the definition for hospital acquired pneumonia? What is the definition of hospital acquired pneumonia? Anyone? What is the definition? We just talked about community acquired pneumonia. Asha, anything you can add? What is hospital acquired pneumonia? Anything, no problem. You can make mistakes now. What is hospital acquired pneumonia? Niharika? Up to 48 hours. So any pneumonia that develops after 48 hours of hospital stay is called as hospital acquired pneumonia. Any pneumonia that develops after 48 hours of stay in the hospital is called as hospital acquired pneumonia. Right? Uh, so what is the definition of ventilator associated pneumonia? Uh, no, the answer is 48 hours after passing an endotracheal tube because being on mechanical ventilation can be even NIV. Okay, so it has to be ventilated after more than 48 hours after being on the EP tube. Clear? Am I clear on this? Huh? So when I say hospital acquired pneumonia, it means after getting admitted to the hospital, 48 hours later he develops features of pneumonia. It is called as hospital acquired pneumonia. Whereas if a patient has been on the ventilator and then 48 hours later develops a pneumonia, it's called as ventilator. When you say ventilator means endotracheal tube, it is called as ventilator associated pneumonia. Importantly, also those patients, for example, I'll give you another slightly tricky situation. You have one patient on admitted on day one, uh, this is uh, date is say 1st of April, huh? 1st of April that is there. 1st of April, 2nd of April you extubate this patient, he is out, 2nd uh, of April also is on, 3rd of April you extubate this patient uh, and at this evening you develop pneumonia, uh, but there is no ED tube here, so, this is 48 hours, no, but if you have a tube, if you don't have, what you have, the requisite of the ventilator pneumonia is what? First to have a tube. Now what has happened over here? There is no tube here. So the definition also includes those patients who have been extubated one day earlier. You are, you are understanding? So it also includes those patients who have been extubated one day earlier. Why is this so important? This is very important because when you are actually calculating VAP rate, VAP rate, when I say ventilator associated pneumonia rate, it is number of VAPs number of ventilator associated pneumonia divided by number of ventilator days ventilator days into thousand this is your wrap rate so in any any ventilator you need to, you need to actually find you need to uh, you need in any kind of uh, uh, like a hospital you need to know your wrap rates 
and knowing your VAT rates is very very important because it's a quality indicator of the ICO. Okay, that's why you need to understand how do you find out this is VAT or not. That's why the definition should be clear. If your definition is not clear, you will not be able to calculate your VAT rate. If you cannot calculate your VAT rates, your entire quality control of your ICU will actually go down. Clear? So again, what is the definition of ventilator-associated pneumonia? Two prerequisites. One, the patient should have ET tube. Second prerequisite should be on the on the ET tube for more than 48 hours, or should have been just extubated one day prior. Clear? After 48 hours. Clear on this? Huh? So that in that, if you extubate, there is no tube. The prerequisite is gone out. You are understanding, that's why we are actually talking like this. Clear on this? Is it clear till now? Huh? And you understood the VAT rate, how you calculate? Number of VAT divided by number of ventilator days into 1000. This is very important because when you actually are going to, uh, 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 in the exams also, what uh, you will know, be asked, what is how we calculate the VAT rate? Okay, and that's when you start talking about uh, how do you do this. Right? Clear? Yeah. Now, when we go to hospital acquired pneumonia or ventilator associated pneumonia, let us, uh, let us focus on ventilator associated pneumonia. Now, why are we focusing on ventilator associated pneumonia in the first place? Because the chances of one person as per one study of getting ventilator associated pneumonia is 3% per day on the ventilator up to the first 5 days and after 5 days it becomes 2% per day up to 10 days and after that it is 1% per day every day. Okay, first of all, this is the incidence. What is the incidence again? See, it, what the study has said that for the first 5 days, you will have a 3%, 3%, 3% incidence. After the first 5 days, you have a 2% uh, incidence for the next three, uh, 5 days. And after that, you get a 1% incidence. This is clear? Okay, now this is the incident. The second thing is we are worried about this particular ventilator associated pneumonia because it has got something called as attributable mortality. That means any which ways any patient who has got septic shock or sepsis has a mortality of somewhere around 30% to 40%. This is known. This is known that a patient of septic shock that comes to you, uh, 30 to 40% of the times he is going to die. <coughs> he is going to die. Okay. Now, on top of it, if this patient develops a ventilator associated pneumonia after 48 hours of being in the hospital, for example, you have a patient who had a urinary tract infection. He was breathing very, uh, very uh, uh, with a huge tachypnea and distress. He wasn't. I took the tube and I passed the uh, uh, endotracheal tube. Two days later, the patient developed a ventilator associated pneumonia. The patient is on antibiotic, patient BB is okay, but patient has a very high chance of dying because ventilator pneumonia has a 10% attributable mortality. It adds a 10% attributable mortality. Matlab, the patient may not die of septic shock, but the patient will die 10% of the cases because of ventilator associated pneumonia. Very important point. Very, very important point. Right? Now, this is one of the reasons that we have a problem. The other reason that we have a problem over here is VAP is divided into two parts. You have the early onset and you have the late onset. Now, what is the early onset? If early onset means in less than four days if the patient gets back, and late onset means more than four days patient gets back. Everything is after 48 hours, but if it is after before four days and after four days, the organisms over here are much more difficult to treat than the organisms over here. This is the thinking. Clear? Yeah. So the day when you get the ventilator so pneumonia also becomes extremely crucial. Are you understanding? The day of ventilator pneumonia becomes very crucial because if you're getting it within one day of hospital admission or within two days of within the third day of getting it, the organisms will be quite difficult, to, easy to treat. Contrast to those uh, organisms that are after four days. So you must know early onset VAP and late onset VAP. There are two uh, terminologies: early onset VAP and late onset VAP. We started by talking about VAP. We told about the attributable mortality. We explained about how much VAP rate could come. We then explained why VAP is dangerous, and then we came to a conclusion which VAP is more dangerous: early VAP or late VAP. Clear? Sir, is it because of starting of antibiotics and uh, no, it's, it is an incidence. It's an incidence of difficult to treat organisms that come after four days. It's an incidence. You understand, no? Yeah. It's an incidence. It's not because of starting antibiotics. So that comes to the question. The VAP has another problem. And as we go ahead, we'll understand the problem. The VAP has a problem of over-diagnosis and has a problem of over-treatment. 
this is an issue that has a problem of over diagnosis and also has a problem of over treatment you understand you tend to think that this may be VAP and you escalate the antibiotics when it's usually not VAP huh? so what has studies said that in 40% of cases in 40% of cases <coughs> it was not diagnosed as VAP and the treatment was started entirely in 40% of cases that's why you need to understand how to diagnose this problem Okay, uh, that is why it is important for you to understand how to diagnose this problem. All right. Uh, so let's take an example who comes in uh, uh, after uh, a ventilator after uh, intubation and it's almost three days time. So how do you diagnose the problem? So let's let's go one by one. Such so, such so, so how to diagnose this problem? First, there's a new spike. Pure spike is there. So so when we talk about it, what do we talk about? You just said fever spike, so that is clinical feature. Clinical. <coughs> now, what are the clinical features you're talking about? You said fever spike, okay? So you said pyrexia, new onset pyrexia. It has to be new onset pyrexia. However, this does not tell you anything about infection or the or ventilator associated pneumonia. It just tells you okay. that there is an inflammation, not even infection. It can be just inflammation. So inflammatory features, okay. So inflammatory features is what we're talking about. Inflammatory features. So tell me, oh, one is pyrexia. Then we are still at clinical features. So that's why you must understand, huh? Tachycardia increased respiratory. No. <laughs> Increase yes. secretions. So clinical features. Change in, in color. Secretions in which are secretions. changing in color or changing in quantity. Secretions that are changing in color or changing in volume. Clinical features are still in inflammation. We are still in inflammation. We have not yet gone to infection. We are still in inflammation. Okay. Uh, changing in color and changing in volume. Then, then come on. We are in inflammation, okay, now also. Increase auto requirement. Increase? Auto requirement. Okay, increase auto requirement. Clinical features increased auto requirement, that is step up of P or degeneration of PO2 by FRO ratio. Then? Then? Very important, we do every day. Leukocytosis, right? Huh? WBC counts that are more than 12,000 or less than 4,000. Or the presence of toxic granulations or bandemia more than 5% on the CBC. Huh? So you have inflammation. Okay, when you say inflammation, you talk about pyrexia. Hmm? We've talked about secretions being excessive color and excessive volume or change of volume. Then we talk about oxygen requirements, PF ratios deteriorating, and PO2 requirements are being stepping up. And you have WBC counts that are going more than 12,000 or less than 4,000. This is only the clinical features for inflammation. What is this? Clinical features for inflammation. That is all this is. This is not bad. Then, you have your clinical features. Then, next, you have not yet gone to diagnosis. Come on, go ahead with diagnosis. Radiological. Radiological, Radiological diagnosis. diagnosis. So, what is the reason that you are talking about? X-ray. X-ray. New, new, new patch. Sorry? New patch. New patch. So, what is the patient you had two days? Patient was, so, answer is X-ray that shows a new patch in a patient who did not have bronchiectasis, asthma or previous problems. You understand? Huh? It has to be a new patch. Okay? A new patch in a patient who does not have bronchiectasis, does not have structural lung disease, does not have all those things that are there in the lungs. New patch. Or it has to be a progressive or persistent infiltrate and this will require two chest x-rays. Persistent progressive infiltrate has to be there. Persistent progressive infiltrate has to be there. Huh? That will require two x-rays. So if you have a patient who is not, who is completely, you just, patient was okay, we had done a chest x-ray when he was not intubated, there was no patch, 
Huh? And then, uh, uh, I mean, patient was normal, no reason to have a patch. Patient was otherwise okay. He intubated. Two days, three days later, you showed a patch. That is only one x ray. That one x ray signifies radiological progression. You understand? One x ray. Because that's a, otherwise, he should have had a normal x ray. Whereas you have a patient who already had, say, for example, a bronchiectasis and one part of the lung is involved. One part of the lung is involved. In that case, you will require two x rays successively done one after the other, which actually shows persistent. Progressive infiltrate. Clear of this? Huh? Yeah, within one to two days. Okay. Huh? Why one to two days? Because what happens is once you have intubated your patient, once you have once your patient has been intubated, okay. If if this was just atelectasis, if this was just atelectasis, the next day the patch will go off. You understand? If this was just atelectasis, the next day the patch will just go off. You're understanding? Huh? That's why we need to do it after a day. Okay, after a day. Clear of this? Uh, persistent progressive infiltrate not attributable to pulmonary edema, effusion, nodules. It should not be uh, uh, attributable to effusion, nodules and pulmonary edema. Clear? Uh, so you have X-ray or a CT scan. But we don't do CT scans on a regular basis for a diagnosis of it. Clear? So till now, nothing. We are only an X-ray. What is the, this is the definition. There is a definition here, okay? Because these are the ones that actually looks at definitions. That's why you must know the definition to actually diagnose a condition, right? So severe as VAP because it's going to cause mortality, right? So what is the third? Microbiology. Sorry? Microbiology. Microbiology, exactly. The third one is microbiology. So till now, till now, till now, this part would have been these two parts was, is collectively called as Infection related ventilator associated condition. It is not VAPS. Okay, here it will be called as infection related ventilator associated condition, where this would be probable and this would be possible. If this all is there, this is probable VAP and this would be called as possible VAP together. Clear? Huh? So if I have a combination of a clinical feature, a radiological feature together, what will I call it as? Infection related, ventilator related associated, associated condition, condition. And then when both are available, it is called as possible. possible. Right? When both of these are there. Possible. Okay. So you need any one of these, any, only two of these you require and one of this you require. Right? Two of this and one of this and you are calling it as? Possibly. Possible. Possible. If only this is available, it is called as? Probable, probable right? Right. because you don't, you have not demonstrated anything. Clear? Clear on this? Clear on this? And the last and final, which actually will put it towards ventilator associated pneumonia and confirm the pathology is microbiology. And can you tell me what microbiology says over here? Tell me what microbiology here will tell you. Come on. So the what microbiology? What are we talking here? When you have that, what do you do? To diagnose what you do? Huh? Yeah, so there are three methods that we do. There are three things. What do we do? There are three things that we do. What is the first thing we do? Yeah, so what is that? What, what is it? What do you do for that? You said what? ET secretions for culture. The simplest thing is tracheal cultures. Okay. ET secretions for culture. The second thing that we do is called as Bronchoalveolar lavage. And the third thing that we do is called as protected specimen brushing. We don't do this. We don't do these things. Huh? Now, why do you need to know this? Why do you need to know what are you sending? Why do you need to do? Because the criteria for diagnosis. There's a criteria for diagnosis. The criteria. Because today, if I have a patient on the endotracheal tube and I send the cultures, I will get presence of some bacteria or the other. There is a high chance because within two or three days the endotracheal tube gets colonized by biofilm. The inside flora gets populated by some colonizer. You are understanding, huh? So you need to figure out whether this is infective or not. And to know whether it's infective or not, I need to read my report saying what is my colony forming units. What is my colony forming units? So if uh, if my ET secretions show a colony forming unit of more than 10 days to 5 of a certain bacteria, it is indicative of a positive culture signifying confirmed VAP. If all these criteria come inside. If my bar has got more than 10 days to 4 colony forming units, 
it is actually signifying a positive culture and confirming my diagnosis for that. If my uh, uh, microbiology is showing me protected specimen brush culture of more than 10 raised to 3, it is actually showing, telling me that this is confirmatory for BAP, BAP when we have the above criteria that is there in place. Clear? Huh? So, which patients will require ET secretions? More often than not, patients who have ventilator associated pneumonias, more often than not, are going to be those who have got something called as bronco pneumonia. This is different from community acquired pneumonia. Now, what happens in a community acquired pneumonia? A patient has got lobar pneumonia. And when a lobar pneumonia is there, there is a row full of pneumonia. Okay, and but unfortunately, it is not in, uh, in close, uh, uh, close, close proximity to the bronchus. It is in the lobe, you know. It is not in close proximity to the host. That way, patient does not produce putum as much. Mm. However, classically, these ventilator-associated pneumonias are something called as bronco pneumonias. When I say bronco pneumonias on CDs, can you heard the term tree in bud appearance? You have heard tree in bud appearance, where the alveolus, pneumonia, and bronchus are in one line. Okay, so what happens is it is easy to take a culture. So, more often than not, in ventilator associated pneumonia, you may not require a culture. You may, you may not require a bronchoscopic culture. You may require just a ET secretion culture. Clear on this? You may require ET secretion culture. Whereas, if you, if you don't get a culture, if you cannot get a culture, then I will resort to a directed bar. Now, why is this good? Because you are directing your bronchoscope to that particular region. Say it's in the lower lobe, I'm going to dive, I'm going to send my bronchoscope to my lower, lower lobe and take out those secretions. What is a protected specimen brush? You have a brush inside the scope, you have a brush inside the scope, the entire brush is inside the scope, so it does not get contaminated as it goes inside. Once it goes inside, this goes inside and then takes the specimen and comes outside. That is called a protected specimen brush. We don't resort to this as of now. Clear? Uh, so more often than not, you will go do away with the ET secretions for culture. Okay, now you can do something in the middle which is called as mini bar. Now what is mini bar? Mini bar is you take your sterile suction catheter, pass it directly inside till you get the resistance. That means you have abutted your uh, uh, cannula at the end of the bronchus. Now you put up around uh, 10 to 15 ml of fluid and do a lavage there, 20 ml, 30 ml of lavage over there. You insert, 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 20, 30 ml of lavage over there. And then you aspirate and take it out. This is called as mini bar. This is called as mini bar. You, you, you understand me? So ideally, mini bar is done this way. Ideally, how is mini bar done? You take a catheter, put that catheter on the serai technique inside the endotracheal tube, let it go directly inside. Let it go directly inside. Now into that block, into that tube, you pass 20 ml. Not disconnect the ventilator, put 20 cc, do ambu and take suction. Don't go like that. When you do mini ball, what you do is, you take the suction catheter, go inside till you reach the end. Once you reach the end of that particular place where it is not going ahead, you pass 20 ml of fluid there. Okay, you pass 20 ml of fluid there and then nicely you give 20, 30, 40, you give 30 ml also of fluid inside and then you aspirate the whole thing. This is called as mini ball. Clear? This is called as mini ball which is equivalent to all ET secretions for culture as well as bronchoscopy. You don't need to do a bronchoscopy anymore. Understood? Am I clear how you do a mini bar? Huh? How you do a mini bar? The follicles are specifically same at S24. At S24. Okay, it's the same as bronchoscopy. That's why we are okay to do a mini bar. Clear? Huh? So this means to say tomorrow when you want to diagnose ventilator associated pneumonia, I need to be certain what I'm looking at. Okay, I need to be certain on what I'm looking at. That's why I need the clinical features, I need the radiological features, and I need the microbiology to actually diagnose this as ventilator associated pneumonia. In the same region, it's important for you to understand when you're spending sputum culture, when you're sending ET secretion for culture, it is said to be a good quality. How do you say a good quality? When? When epithelial cells are more than. When the neutrophils are more than 25, and the neutrophils are more than 25, and the squamous epithelial cells are less than 10, okay, that is when you will call this as a adequate adequate sample. So when you are taking the looking at the sample, you are just not looking at the number of name of the organism. You are looking at the quality of the sample, and you are looking at the uh, and you are looking at how many bacteria are found. So if your sputum grows multifocal three four bacteria, it may not be it may be your colonizers. 
if it is growing a single one, it is most probably looking towards uh, that particular problem. You you understand? It cannot be three four bugs together. If it is polymorphic, means there is it is probably colonizer. This is not right. This, if you if you get one, this is what it is. So interpretation of this is very 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 important of entered versus entered pneumonia. Clear? Have you understood this? Any doubts till now? Any doubts on how to diagnose where? Huh? I hope there are no doubts here. Okay. Now, what are we missing here? What are we missing here? So, the few things that we are missing over here is one of the things we are missing is blood cultures. See, there are no blood cultures here. So, you can imagine blood cultures is so low on the diagnosis. It is so low, we don't really require a blood culture. In fact, a blood culture can be negative many of the times because these patients classically would have been either on antibiotics or other way around, blood cultures does not signify that this is ventilator associated pneumonia. It's a blood culture, it may be two different problems, septicemia in one side and ventilator the pneumonia in the other side. Are you understanding? So blood cultures are not coming in over here at all. You don't have blood cultures in this in these cases. Are you understanding? Clear? Huh? What about CRP PCT? That is also not here. You see, is there a CRP or a PCT here? It's not there. Uh, you don't need to do a CRP or PCT to actually figure out whether there is a ventilator associated pneumonia because classically a procalcitonin and a CRP are inflammatory markers in the first place. CRP is a highly inflammatory marker and a procalcitonin less than 0.25 is an indication to de-escalate your antibiotics. It is not something to start an antibiotic. Are you understanding? There is no reason to do a PCT to set to uh, uh, what is the point? There is no point. The definition doesn't involve it. The definition involves these features. Are you understanding? Huh? So classically what happens is, when a patient has got a clinical feature in an x-ray finding, we start an antibiotic and we want this to come back to you. So imagine, at least in 50% of the cases we are wrong. At least in 50% of the cases when we start an antibiotic, we are wrong. Because it may not be valid. You understand? That is why it's very important to come back with these answers because if you don't, we will be giving antibiotic for a reason that is unknown. Clear? Similarly, you will also look at certain organisms. For example, uh, if you are getting a candida, if you are getting a candida, a fungus that is coming in from there, no, it is not going to be a ventilator associated pneumonia because fungal pneumonias are almost non-existent, less than 10 for less than 1%. Okay, candida usually is a colonizer in the respiratory tract. Candida causing uh, uh, a major issue in the lungs is very less likely because candida is going to grow where there is going to be less air, right? There is all air there. Okay, uh, so it grows on bread and all, right? All this fungus and all, where there is nothing. So, uh, in short, we cannot have a candida that is coming in from the endotracheal tube and we call it as fungal pneumonia because candida is always usually a colonizer and they are not true infections. Clear? Clear? So when you go back to community acquired pneumonia, we are looking at organisms that are streptococcus, that are H influenza, we are talking at organisms like this. Huh? Whereas if you come to this VAC group, we are looking at organisms that are largely going to be gram negative. Okay, are going to be gram negative. And when I say gram negative, we are looking at those organisms that come from the Enterobacteria C family, which includes Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, E. coli, these are the bacteria I am looking at. I will not get an enterococcus there. Huh? I will get an enterobacter, but I will not get an enterococcus there. Huh? I will not get uh, candida over there. Huh? And at instances, I will get a staphylococcus if the incidence of MRSA in my hospital is very, very high. Right? Huh? Why do you need to know this? Because that's how you are going to treat your patients. You are going to treat your patients based on what could be the likely organism that is going to grow in the lung. Similarly, when you have community acquired pneumonia, looking at H influenza and streptococcus pneumonia, which are very difficult to grow. It doesn't grow in the culture. It doesn't grow in the stain. Are you understanding? It doesn't grow in the culture. It doesn't grow in the stain. That's why very often when you do a community acquired pneumonia, sputum culture, push me Tunia, because streptococcus and H influenza are extremely difficult to, uh, to grow. Similarly, Legionella, which is an atypical organism, almost impossible to grow. Are you understanding? Legionella, almost impossible to grow. Clear? That is why, since streptococcus is not growing, H influenza is not growing, we are resorting in severe community acquired a recommendation to do urinary Legionella and urinary streptococcus, urinary pneumococcal antigen. You are understanding? 
बिकॉज इट डजन ग्रो इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू ग्रो इट अरे अंडरस्टैंड इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू ग्रो इट तो ग्रो नहीं होता है तुम ग्राफ्टेन बेस के हो बट यू कैन नॉट गेट एनरी and that and since it is community acquired nuclear luckily it is made in such a way that these are very very sensitive organisms because it is community acquired and because it is community acquired they are sensitive the backbone antibiotic that it can give is an atypical cover which includes azithromycin and a ceftriaxone now you understand why ceftriaxone when you are looking at community acquired pneumonia why why because you want to cover what atypical streptococcus you want to cover h influenza which are classically very sensitive organisms to streptococcus you want to cover legionella and mycoplasma which are atypical organisms which are classically covered by azithromycin clear or azithromycin or clarithromycin and that is why when you are actually going to uh, treat patients of community acquired pneumonia okay who are otherwise okay who come into you with severe community acquired pneumonia ceftriaxone and azithromycin is actually enough unless unless this patient has got cross immunosuppression unless this patient has got a structural lung disease so if the patient has got a structural lung disease like bronchiectasis okay or is immunosuppressed you can still require to cover these patients with some gram negative cover better gram negative cover which is a blgl like tetracycline tablet Yeah. So if you have a Ranocobel patient coming with severe community acquired pneumonia, uh, severe community acquired pneumonia into the ICU, uh, and this is clearly from the community, okay, and does not have any other structural lung disease, my trial, uh, my uh, treatment does not need anything more than a CEF trial, so because the likely organism is going to be Streptococcus or a Leishman cancer. Clear? Am I clear on this? Huh? Clear on this? The problem is when you are looking at ventilator associated pneumonia. So when I when I am looking at ventilator associated pneumonia, things are simple. In a severe case, I will give a ceftriaxone, I will give a azithromycin, and I will probably start a steroid. A steroid is generally given in severe community acquired pneumonia at a dose of anywhere between 40 milligrams per day of prednisolone or 8 milligrams of dexamethasone tapered over 10 days. Okay, uh, this is what you want to do with severe community acquired pneumonia. Addition of MRSA cover, which includes linezolid, ticoplanin, or vancomycin, is done on the basis of culture patterns, or when you think that the MRSA prevalence is very very high in the community. Here, huh? there are scores which are called as Shore score, which if you look at will actually give you an idea whether this patient requires gram positive cover or not. Okay, there is something called Shore score. Okay, the Shore score will tell you whether they require gram positive cover or not. Yeah. Sir, in community acquired pneumonia, this microscopic finding, if at all, we do like power. Which we don't need it. We don't need it. Intubated patient. Intubated patient, yes, we want to do it. It will be the same only. It will be the same only. The criteria to diagnose this will be the same only. But the organisms will be all simple organisms. So classically, you may very less likely that you have severe community acquired pneumonia coming on an intubated state. Unless the patient is even compromised, unless this patient has got structural lung diseases, you understand? It is very less likely that a community acquired pneumonia will get intubated. Are you understanding? Extremes of age will be yes, huh? But otherwise, very less likely. Sir, she didn't have any of these normal organisms. She had got organisms. That's why she got intubated. Are you understanding? She didn't get intubated. Otherwise, she got intubated because she had difficult to treat organisms. Are you understanding? Otherwise, a usual community of pneumonia, which many of us have many a times. That guy had a streptococcus. Yeah, streptococcus. Simple streptococcus. Is it streptococcus or streptococcus? But he worsened because of the clepsia. He had both. Okay, he had both. But he worsened because of, he was worsened because of clepsia and not because of streptococcus. Are you understanding? Huh? Here. Now the question that comes is, you are now in a situation of call. Go to call him. So, which he did she call for mental? Huh? Dictum was there or something? So, in mental, so when you are ventilator, now the question is, now you are coming to ventilator or something. What? How to treat B A P or H? Huh? So, body. Any? We have understood about uh, the definition of ventilator or something. What? Huh? How do you prevent this? The first question is uh, the prevention, or the, or, and, and then we come to the treatment. Okay, how do you prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia? How do you prevent this? Uh, 
Sorry. How do you prevent this? Exam for me. Huh? How do you prevent this? So any uh, how do you prevent this? Come on. Sorry. First, first thing is what? Maintenance of sterility during intubation. Semi recumbent, not propped up. Semi recumbent position. The first intervention is semi. Before even this, what is the? Before even this, before even this, what is it? Avoid endotracheal intubation. Use techniques like non-invasive ventilator. So the first thing would be avoid endotracheal intubation if possible huh? or remove tubes when readiness for extubation avoid endotracheal intubation if possible or remove tubes when patient is ready for extubation all right keep the ventilator base extremely minimal this is very important the second thing that we we'll do to prevent is semi recumbent position Huh? So that's it's important to understand what is semi-recumbent. What is semi-recumbent position? Semi-recumbent position is a position that is not supine, not body. It's somewhere in the middle, 10, 15, 20, somewhere between 30 degrees, around 30 degrees. It's not propped up. When you say propped up is 90, you know, 45 to 90. It's not propped up. It is semi-recumbent position. So when you say semi-recumbent position, it means somewhere between 10 to 30 degrees. What you must understand now, the corollary to this is, keeping them in a 45 degree angle is almost impossible because the patient will slip down. So the compliance is not okay. Keeping them in supine position is known to cause increased aspiration and that is why you don't want to keep it supine. Clear on this? That is why you want to keep it at a 10 to 20 degrees to 30 degrees kind of semi-recumbent position. Clear? Clear to know? Semi recumbent position. Okay, then? Subglottic suction. You cannot put two, three things together. Subglottic suction drainage. Answer is subglottic suction drainage. Okay. So all patients who got ventilator more than 20, 48 to 72 hours need to have a tube having subglottic suction drainage. So if you have a patient who's come from an operation theater and you feel that this patient is going to be on a tube for next three or four days, this patient needs to be on a tube which has subglottic suction drainage. Okay, subglottic suction drainage thus becomes very very important in the prevention of ventilator associated pneumonia. You all, you all know what is subglottic suction drainage? Huh? There is a port that from where you actually inflate which is called as the pilot balloon and there is a second port from which you actually aspirate a yellow color port which is called as subglottic suction drainage port. Right? So you have subglottic suction drainage. is a third important uh, uh, criteria or uh, prevention of ventilator associated pneumonia. When you say subglottic, mean what is happening? This is the glottis, this is the tube, you have a cuff here. Subglottic means under glottis, that is somewhere over here. So the opening is over here. So the suction drainage occurs from here. So subglottic suction drainage. Clear? Subglottic suction drainage. So avoid endotracheal intubation and remove tubes as soon as possible. Semi recumbent position, subglottic suction drainage. Then So yes, you can say cup pressure, but you first tell what is the one that you really need to do. Okay. Oral hygiene. Answer is regular oral hygiene. Right. Regular oral hygiene. So don't say what you are going to use. Whether I am going to use chlorhexidine mouthwash, whether I am going to use toothpaste, whether I am going to just clean the mouth with water. No. Regular oral hygiene. Okay. So the fourth thing is regular oral hygiene and why it is so important because we know that all the ventilator associated pneumonia bugs are coming from the oral cavity they are coming from the oral cavity and that is why it is causing ventilator associated pneumonia 
Okay, so since we have the oral cavity, the oral, uh, once you give the patient a single antibiotic, the oral cavity for flora changes. The flora changes to difficult to bacteria. Today, if I sit over here and you give me a septriazone, my oral cavity bacteria will change. It will immediately change. My entire uh, my footprint of bacteria will change in my body. You understand? And this, these particular bacteria become the difficult to treat organisms over a period of time, and that then goes inside and causes Kepsella, Pseudomonas, all the related bacteria are associated. Yeah, that is why regular oral hygiene is the fourth reason, the fourth way of preventing ventilator associated pneumonia. Then, then, it is actually daily, uh, daily sedation, vacation. And spontaneous awakening trial. Daily sedation vacation and spontaneous awakening trial. These are the five reasons to prevent ventilator associated pneumonia. So these five things you have to say. These five things you have to say when you are actually talking about prevention of BAP. You have to say these five things. If you keep on saying suctioning, 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 it doesn't make sense to me. Does it make sense to me? Are you understanding? It has to be these five things. Niharika, uh, you should have said these five things. Move it, ask this. Ashok, should tap, tap, tap. Uh, avoid endotracheal intubation. Sanvirika, because this is what the question will be. Basically, if you give a case of VAP, the question will be how to prevent this. This is the question, the simple question. And why we are asking? Because it's standard. It is standard. It is not anything more than anything. It is just standard. Uh, it is standard that you need to know. Okay. So, Semi avoid endotracheal intubation, semi recumbent positioning, subglottic suction drainage, uh, uh, regular oral hygiene, and daily sedation interruption and spontaneous awakening trial. Okay, that means every day you stop the sedation, let the patient wake up, and then again put him back to sleep because we know that when you do something like that, the days of mechanical ventilation actually reduces. And since the days of mechanical ventilation actually reduces, your incidence of ventilator associated pneumonia actually comes down. Clear? Clear? Any, any queries here? Is not clear what? Clear? Any doubts still now? Huh? The rest of the interventions that come after this. You know, you can or cannot say. What are the rest of the investigations that you that you can talk about? Maintaining cup pressure <coughs> more than 20 to 25. Maintaining cup pressure more than 20 to 25. Avoiding uh, change of circuits uh, routinely unless they are contaminated. Avoiding ch change of circuits routinely unless they are contaminated. So these are few things and three, four more things you may want to say, uh, but these have to be there. Okay, there are, and when you talk about back bundle, when you talk about back bundle, there is something called as the IHI bundle. IHI bundle. They have these things, plus they have something called as stress ulcer prophylaxis, huh? and it has got DVT prophylaxis, which for, I don't know why it is there in this bundle. If you ask me, I don't know why it is there in this bundle, but the IHI bundle, the IHI bundle for back also has stress ulcer prophylaxis and has DVT prophylaxis. Okay, don't mention this. We don't want to hear this. We don't want to mention But if somebody asks you, what is the recommended IHI bundle for VAP? You should say this and you should say this. IHI bundle. However, there is no reason why a DVT prophylaxis will actually prevent VAP. There is no reason for this. In fact, stress ulcer prophylaxis will cause more VAP. It is the other way around. Okay, huh? clear? Hmm? Clear on this? Now comes. Now that we have understood how to diagnose VAP, we have understood how to prevent a, a VAP. Okay, the third thing is how to treat these hospital acquired problems. How to treat them? Okay, so we we'll group, we have understood about the treatment of severe community acquired pneumonia. Okay, now what we will do is we will understand the treatment of hospital acquired pneumonia. Right? So let us group the, the entire thing can be grouped together into hospital acquired pneumonia. Huh? Hospital acquired pneumonia. One is with endotracheal tube. 
and one, the one is without endotracheal tube and one is with ET tube. That's how it is, right? Huh? One is with ET tube and one is without ET tube. Clear on this? Clear? Okay. Listen to this carefully, okay? Now, if this patient has got septic shock, okay, or if this patient has got IV antibiotics in the last 90 days, or if this patient has got ARDS, okay, is this a kuch bhi agar hai, or yes, I do, ye bhi nahi septic shock hai, IV antibiotics hai, ARDS prior to app. Apart from this patient also has renal replacement therapy that is ongoing. Apart from this, the patient has got renal replacement therapy that is ongoing. These patients that are, have to be put on antibiotics that involve two antibiotics against pseudomonas and one antibiotic against MRSA. And in these two antibiotics, they have to be from two different classes. This is the empirical antibiotic. Here? Any queries now? You've understood this? Can you repeat again? The last part. Sorry? Can you repeat the last part of the answer? Again, I'll go back. Hospital types by pneumonia are two types. One is with an endotracheal tube and the other is without an endotracheal tube. We started by talking about this, isn't it? Huh? Now, when you have the, the patient with without an endotracheal tube, if this patient has got septic shock, or if this patient has got IV antibiotics in the last 90 days, or this patient has got ARDS, okay, or in this category of patients, you have got the same thing, septic shock, you have got IV antibiotics in the last 90 days, you have ARDS prior to the VAP, or you have renal replacement therapy, or like we initially said, has got the VAP after 5 days of hospitalization. Huh? Find a date on set. Okay. If you have any of these things, I need to put this patient on three antibiotics. Which are the three antibiotics? This is this is these are not guidelines. Okay, these are not guidelines. These are not something that I will have to do. These are the things that guide me. Ki mujhe aisa karna hai, depending on what is there in my hospital. You are understanding, but somebody asks you, then you can actually follow these guidelines as a good starting point. For you as a good starting point, this makes sense. Where you will say, I will put two pseudo two antibiotics against pseudomonas, that is two anti-pseudomonal antibiotics of two different classes. For example, you have meropenem and you have uh, uh, piperacillin, uh, 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 I mean aminoglycoside, or you have piperacillin diazepactam or you have levofloxacin. Both are against pseudomonas and both are from different classes. Piperacillin diazepactam is a BL, BLI, whereas levofloxacin is a quizolone. They are two different classes and I will add an MRSA cup. And I will add an MRSA cup. This is if this patient is as sick as this. Right? Clear on this till now? Clear? Any queries till now? Any queries? Now, once you finish this and the answer is no to this, answer is no. The answer is yes, you are doing this. Right. Now, the answer is no to this. He is not having septic shock, he is not in IV antibiotics, he uh, is having hospital acquired pneumonia, but his pulse rate is well, BP is okay, but he doesn't go into this, fit into any of these criteria. He does not have ARDS, he is not RRDP or so, uh, and he has been in the hospital for 2 or 3 days. Okay, uh, maybe 3 days. So the answer is no here. If the answer is no, what do I do? I now figure out what is the prevalence of MRS in my unit. Alright. If the prevalence of MRSA in my unit is more than 10%, and how do I know this? From my antibiogram, from what happens in my hospital, I look at my antibiogram and I know what is happening in my hospital. If the <coughs> prevalence of MRSA is more than 10%, then I will, end, I will, if it is, if the answer is yes, I will add the gram positive cover over here. I will add the gram positive cover here. Right? Uh, if my answer is no, I will not add the gram positive cover. I will not add the gram positive cover. That means I am still at a condition where I may need to use just two pseudomonas classes. Now, whether you use two pseudomonas, the next step would be 
actually looking at your pseudomonas resistance rate. If your pseudomonas resistance rate is more than 10 percent or your gram stain comes back saying abundant gram negative bacilli. It comes and says abundant gram negative bacilli are there in my gram stain. I will use here, this, if the answer to this is yes, I will use two medicines against pseudomonas. If the answer to this is no, I will use only one monotherapy against the existing gram negative bacillus. You are understanding this? It depends on the antibiotic. Right? So if you if so I'll go back to this once more. Okay. You have a patient who comes and we now know that this patient developed an infection after 48 hours, so it is classified as hospital acquired pneumonia. In that scene, I'm going to look at whether this patient is really sick. When I say really sick means he's got septic shock, he's got mechanical retinal, he's got ARDS, he's got IP antibiotics in the last 90 days. In this patient, what I will do? I mean, if he's very sick, I will put this patient on two different classes of anti pseudomonal drugs and I will add a gram positive cover. Clear? Clear on this? Huh? If the answer to this is no, if the answer to this is no, I will look at what is my staphylococcus cover. Kitta hai my pass, hospital me kitna hai. If it is more than 10%, I will add. Uh, 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 gram positive cover which includes vancomycin, levonidate, toxicin, decoplanin, something like that. Right? Uh, now, the next question is what is my pseudomonas rate? If my pseudomonas resistance rate, that was incidence rate of MRSA, my resistance to pseudomonas is more than 10%, uh, then I will use two anti pseudomonal cover. Of course, most of the pseudomonas cover MSSA. So no problem, but most of these antipsodomonas cover MSSA, so no problem there. Uh, but I will give two pseudomonas cover. But if the answer to that question is no, that or there is less amount of gram uh, negative bacilli on the gram stain, and the answer is no, uh, and the pseudomonas are less than 10%, then I will give single antipsodomonal cover. I can just, just give piperacillin tazobactam or I can just give levoproxacin. Clear? Clear? Huh? Any any question? So so if you look at it, and how long would you continue with antibiotics? Okay, now you have done this empirically. You started. This is an empirical antibiotic. No, these are all empirical. These are all antibiotics that are given empirically. I don't know what is happening here. This is empirical antibiotics of choice. That is why quickly I want to get the stain back. I want to get the culture back so that I can now de-escalate or escalate accordingly. Yet of empirical okay, so I don't know what is inside. I am just giving something based on a theory, based on a guideline. But now the next question is, I need to now give them targeted therapy. And for targeted therapy, what do I need to do? I need to get that cultures quickly. Without those cultures, I can't target the therapy here. Okay. Usually what happens is, I need to de-escalate it to a single antibiotic, or I want to escalate it if the existing organism is resistance. Resistant. Here. How long do you continue this? The amount of time you require to continue an antibiotic for a ventilator associated pneumonia is not more than 7 days. I don't need more than 7 days when I am looking at ventilator associated pneumonia. Okay, unfortunately, procalcitonin has not been studied in cases of ventilator associated pneumonia. However, if the procalcitonins are less than 0.25 in severe community acquired pneumonia, you can actually stop or <coughs> completely stop the antibiotic at day 5 or day 7. You understand? Here, yeah, it's not been very well studied in ventilator associated pneumonia, but in severe community acquired pneumonia, it is kind of studied. Here, yeah, but you can still do a procalcitonin less than 0.25, you can just stop the antibiotic as a guide. Of course, along with it, it has to have a clinical feature that says he's improving, secretions have come down, fat cells are dissolved, BP is stabilized, spiralizers have just come off, oxygenation has improved, so many other things to occur on along with it and then in addition there will be procalcitonin. It can't be, you can just use procalcitonin and say it's point of to stop the antibiotic. It has to be in the context of the patient improving clinically. Clear? Clear on this? Clear on this? So this now actually comes to the end of how to manage ventilator associated pneumonia. Clear?